Hey guys, Joy Blue here. Um, today I'm putting together a training that will teach SQL from the very beginning to give you basically some knowledge that you can build on and, and use other training videos and go search after this. So um, this should give you a good framework. I'm setting this up to be hopefully around 30 to 40 minutes so that we can you can get as much as possible out of that time. Um, and so here are a few of my contact information on this first slide if you need to get a hold of me if you want to find other trainings that I have out there because I have some other videos hanging around. So anyways, let's get started. Um, so the first thing I want to do is give you an overview of this training. Um, a quick, we're going to have a quick introduction of SQL. Then we're going to go straight into creating a database and table. We're going to insert some data, select some data. We're going to do um, some where clauses update the data, delete it, and then um, take the table and make some modifications to it. I'm going to teach you about the primary keys, uh, talk a little bit about an index, create a few more tables, and then we're going to start joining some tables up and get into a couple of advanced features like functions and group buys. So really, if you learn these techniques, you'll have what you need to get started um, to to build on you can start working with it so um, let's start with just this definition of SQL so SQL stands for structured query language and really you can think about that like um, PHP C sharp those are other Java there are other examples of programming languages SQL is the programming language used to talk to databases so what types of databases are out there um, we're going to be using SQL Server in this tutorial. Um, SQL Server is one of them that, that uses SQL. Uh, we have Oracle. It's been around a long time, very popular in corporations. We have MySQL, which is an open source one. We have PostgreSQL. We have SQLite, DB2. And a lot of the big data structures are starting to s standardize on SQL also. So if you learn SQL and the techniques I'm going to teach you, you'll be able to um, advance and use it in some of these other newer technologies also. So you need a tool to write this SQL and we're going to be using SQL Server Management Studio. It comes with SQL Server. There's also um, it, people abbreviated SSMS and then there's um, Oracle's tool which is called SQL Developer. You also have um, SQL Workbench which, which comes with MySQL there's a per one that people purchase that they like. It's called Toad. Um, and there's quite a few others. Um, those are the ones that I've worked with the most. And when you're in a corporate environment, you work with a lot of those. Okay, so that's the introduction. We're going to go straight into um, SQL Server Management Studio, and I'm going to start teaching you how to do this um, SQL stuff. So I have just clicked on the SQL Server Management Studio tool and I opened it up and this is the first screen I come to. It wants me to connect. So SQL Server is a server and it wants me to connect to it. And the normal way you would connect is by typing in localhost or you can just simply type a dot, which you see there. Or SQL Server has something called named instances so I have multiple SQL servers installed on my machine and the one I'm going to connect to is called SQL 2016. Um, there's lots of tutorials out there um, to show you how to get one of these connected up and installed. Um, so I'm not going to go through that right now because I'm trying to teach you as much as I can in a little amount of time. So I'm just going to go ahead and connect up. When you do that in Management Studio, you'll end up with something called the Object Explorer. And so you can see up here that I am connected to my SQL server that is called SQL 2016. Then you see a tree of things going on here. We're only going to touch a few of them today. Um, the main one I want to talk about is this databases. So if you expand that, there's some system databases. Those are automatically installed and they come with the, the installation. We don't need to do anything with those today. There's database snapshots, and that's a newer feature. Don't need to do anything with those today. And then you have 
all these other databases that I've already created. And we're going to create our own database today. So I'm just going to click on databases and I'm going to go new query. And so that opens up your query analyzer window right here and we can start typing in something. The first thing we need to do is say create database and we got to give it a name. And so we're going to call this the customer database. So in order to run that, and I didn't show you that, but I clicked F5. You can actually come over here and there's this execute button right there. And see how underneath the execute it says F5? After you do this a lot, you'll start hitting F5 every time instead of clicking that button. Um, and so basically what I did is I hit F5. We've got a customer database. But notice you don't see it over here. And that's because this tree of folders has not refreshed. So I'm going to go to databases, right click, and go down to refresh. And now I have a customer database. So that was step one. That's creating a database. The database holds all the tables. So now we need some tables to put data into. So I expanded the customer database and there's a bunch of other folders in here. And what we want are tables. It comes with system tables, which we don't see any right now, file tables and external tables. What we want to do is create our own user tables. But before we do that, we need to make sure we're in the right spot. So we open this query window from just the databases folder. And there's this area right here that says master. Well, let me show you what that's connected to. If I go to system databases, it's connected to this database. We don't want to create a table in that database. So there's a couple ways to change over to the customer database. And so one, we could just hit this drop down and you can see customers in there and we could switch to it. But there's also this other thing where you can say use and we can say customer. If I go over and run that, now look, it switched that over to the customer database. So now we're in the right spot, let's create our table. So we're gonna do what's called a create table statement. So we say create table and we're gonna say customer. And so that will create a table. And within tables, we have columns. So let's go ahead and put some parentheses in. And I'm just tabbing out to for so we can read it better. And I, well, if we're going to have a customer table, we're probably going to want a first name. And then we have to put in what type of data goes in that column. So in this case, I'm going to put in a varchar. And then how long should that column, how, how much is the maximum that we want to store? And I'll put in 50. So that means we'll have a first name column and it can have up to 50 characters. And we're going to want more than one comma, column, so I'm going to put a comma, hit a carriage return, I'm going to do last name. And that's going to store characters also, not numbers, but characters, so I'm going to put a varchar. And I'm going to put 50. And then let's store their age, okay? And so age is going to be a number. And it's not a decimal number where we're going to have um, a decimal point and store digits. It's just going to be an integer. So I'm just going to type int. And so now I've got three columns. And so we can simply run that. And down here, so whenever you run something, I haven't said this yet, but there's a messages area at the bottom. This messages area tells you if it runs successfully, which in this case it says command complete it successfully. So we know that the table was created. So let's look back over here to the left in our object explorer at the tables. And let me refresh that. We'll give it just a second here, see if it finds our table. And so there's our customer table. Now once we have a table, we can right click on that table and do a few things. And so one, we can edit, which we can put in, we can cheat basically and put in some extra data. And two, we can select the top 1000 rows. So if I do that, it's going to write a, a select statement for us. But notice down here in the results area, we don't have any data. So we have to put some data in. So I don't want to cheat. I want to teach you guys how to actually do an insert statement. So let's do that next. 
I'm going to keep this tab because I, I want to keep the scripts. Um, and you can actually even, in here you can save the scripts. So I could do a file and save as and save the scripts so I can bring them back up later. In this case, I'm just going to go back to my customer database and I'm going to go up to this new query button, click that, and I've got a brand new query. And then I'm going to notice that the database context is customer. So now what I want to do is what's called the insert statement. So insert inside this table, if I click the plus, I can go down into columns, and I can see my column names. So I have first name, last name, age. So when I do an insert statement, there's multiple parts for it. So I say insert into, and that's how you start it. And we're going to say the table name. If I say customer, you can see that, well, that's actually the database. See how that says database right now? And that's not what we want. We already know we're in the customer database. Um, and so really, we could say, if you notice over here it says dbo.customer, we can say dbo.customer. Now that should help us out, but inside of Management Studio has this thing called um, database cache, or um, it, what it does is it gives you the IntelliSense, and it needs to be refreshed. So let's go down into IntelliSense. So I'm going to edit IntelliSense, and it says refresh the local cache. And so I'm going to click that. Now when I go back and I type dbo dot, now it knows customers there. And that's because we created that table. It didn't know um, that it was there yet into that cache. So we say insert into. And then after that, you want to say the columns you want to insert into. And you can type them. So I can say first name and see how it finds that. If I hit the down arrow, and then I hit the tab key, it'll finish that up for me. And I can say last name, I can go down arrow to select it, hit the tab key. You can also use your mouse if you want. And then I hit comma, or I can go over here and grab age and drag it on there. Now notice when I drug it on, it put brackets around the column. What brackets do is allow you to have like a space in the name of your column. And you put brackets around it and it would still work. In this case, I did not put a space in, in between like first name. If first name was like that, let me spread that out. If first name was like that, then we would have to put these little brackets around to make it actually work. But it's not like that. So let's go ahead and take that back to where it was. Okay. So we said insert into table and we don't really need that DBL. I'm going to take that off to simplify it. And then we said the column names. Then there's this thing called values. So you just type the word values. And then we're going to put two more parentheses. And so for the first name, I'm going to put Joey. Now, whenever you put a string in inside of SQL Server and most of the SQL languages, you'll want to put a tick. Some other um, SQL, not SQL Server, you may put a double quote. In this case, you put a tick. That signifies that I'm putting a string in there. So now, last name, I'll put blue, comma, and then age, I'll put 40. Notice I don't have to put a string in there for the age. Now, whenever you're working in SQL Server, you don't have to put this in, and you didn't used to be able to put it in. Um, but nowadays, it's good convention to go ahead and put a semicolon to end your statement. Let's run this. So I just executed it, and it says one row affected. So we should have one row in the table. So let's go back over here to the customer table and say select 1,000 rows. And there we have somebody in there, me. OK, so let's add a couple other people in there so we have more data. What I'm going to do is take this statement, we'll Control-C, copy it. You can also right click and, and go to copy. I'm going to control C. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to come down. Control V. Control V. Control V. Control V. I'm going to shrink this down a little bit. So we can see more of these. There we go. So we get them all on one page here. Um, and 
<coughs> at this point what I'm going to do is I'm going to change some of these names. Barry Bonds. We'll make him 50. And then um, who else we want? Mike Schmidt. These are baseball players. Oops, I didn't do that right. Take that out. Put Schmidt here. Um, and then what I'm going to do is actually to speed this up, copy that, and I'm just going to put. Um, I'm going to put some numbers. Oops. Let me grab this again and we'll just dummy some data up. So Mike Schmidt's going to be here multiple times. We're going to have him as one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so notice how this insert kind of got cobbled into the same line. Now what I want to show you is you can either run the whole screen worth of stuff by just hitting execute or you can highlight what you want to run and execute it by itself. So if I run that, it says one row affected. If I grab these two and I hit execute, now it shows two times, right? And I'll go ahead and scroll down and grab the rest of these and run them. And notice how I didn't put a new line on these. The semicolon says we're adding, the, we're stopping the statement. So let's see if this runs. So it still runs. So the semicolon it knows it knows that we're starting a brand new statement. So now if we go to the customer table, select the top 1,000, we've got some data. And I should have changed their ages. That would have helped. Okay, so let's go back to our agenda, make sure that I'm covering everything. So we had the quick introduction of SQL. We created a database and a table. We inserted some data. What we need to do now is select it back out. So we cheated and we use this, you know, over here we right clicked and it created a, a select statement for us. Okay, but I want to not cheat and I want to start from scratch so you can learn it. So I'm going to go back to my customer database. I'm going to select a new query. We got a blank screen. So the basics of selecting data out is what's called the select statement. So you say select and then you can say star and that basically means give me all the columns. Then you can put, I'm going to put a carriage return, you don't have to. You can say from and then you say what table you want. And I'm going to say customer. Okay, that's it. Now all we have to do is execute it and now we've got data. So let's take it a step further and instead of star, you can actually specify the columns. I can say first name, and notice how Management Studio finds that for you, comma, last name, comma, age. So I just selected all three columns. I'm going to hit F5 this time, and I've got the data out. So you can also not specify all of them, and we can say we don't care about age. We can run that, and we got just the first two columns. And what I want to do, though, is I want to put on what's called the WHERE clause, because we're about to use that for an update statement. So I'm going to go ahead and grab age and run it. And I want to grab all of the mics. I want to grab, actually, I want to grab, first of all, everything that starts with mic. So to do that, I'm going to put another carriage return and I'm going to say where. And that's the where clause. The where is where you filter. And you can filter on any column that you have in there. We're going to filter on the first name. And so I type the column name and I say equal to and I say Mike. Now again, Mike is a string. Not a column name, but it's a string so we have to put ticks around it so that it knows it's a string. What if we don't? Let's try it without real quick. I'm going to hit F5. Invalid column. It thinks Mike is a column, but no, it's a string that we want to compare to. So let's go back here, hit F5 again, and 
now we have everybody whose first name starts with Mike. Okay, so next up, um, I want to just get the one that has Schmidt 1. So now I can use an AND operator. I can say AND, and I can go after the last name. I can say equals Schmidt 1. So if I hit F5 and run this, I'm down to one row. Okay, and that's the basics of the WHERE clause. And we can do some other really cool stuff, um, like we can say WHERE last name um, like and you know with the like operator you can put in wildcards so I can say um, Schmidt and I can put in a percent and that's going to give me everything that starts with Schmidt and ends with anything else so let's go ahead and run that and notice how we we picked up Schmidt without a one on it well there's a secondary one that's an underscore Let's see what happens with that. We lost that Schmidt down here. The underscore means it has to match some character. And then the percent meant it didn't have to match anything. And so there's, the, there's other stuff like between, and we can get into more of that if we have time. So next, I want to talk about an update. So if I think this Mike Schmidt, actually let's go to me. So let's query, if I highlight just this top part and hit F5, then I've just run the top part without the where clause. And then you can see me in here. So I'm gonna type that, Joey Blue. I'm gonna say equal to, and I'm gonna run that. And that's got me. So now let's switch over and say, if I'm not 40, what if I was 20 again? Let's update my age. So to do that, I'm going to hit a semicolon, and I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to um, write what's called an update statement. So the update statement says, you start with update, and then you tell what table you're going to update. So you say customer. And then on an update statement, you always want to put a WHERE clause. Unless you're trying to update the whole table, which isn't usually the case, you, you put an, um, a WHERE clause. WHERE, and since we already did the SELECT, I'm going to grab this right here and drop it in there. But now we have to say what columns we want to update. And I want to update age. And I'm going to use what's called the SET statement. So you say SET age equal to 20. Put a semicolon. Let me run that. So that just updated. I'm going to highlight just the whole table again, not do the WHERE clause up here. Run that, and you can see now I have I'm um, age 20. And if I wanted to change it to 35, I just set the age to 35, I rerun it. and my age is 35. Now what happens if I forget the WHERE clause and I just do this? Yep, that's going to update the whole table. Let's do it. Update it eight rows. That's a problem. Let's go look at the whole customer table. So everybody is 35 now. So I don't like that. So now let's go into what's called the delete statement. So <clears throat> we've got data here that's all jumbled up. And I just want to delete the whole thing. I'm going to start a brand new query. And I'm going to say delete. And I'm going to say customer. And I'm going to forewarn you. The delete statement without a WHERE clause is delete all the data in the table. So this can be very fatal if you do this on accident. So <laughs> I'm going to do it. Eight rows were affected. Now that didn't delete the table. The table's still there. That deletes the data 
in the table. If you want to delete the whole table, you'd hit drop, you'd type drop, and that would drop the table. This deletes the data. So if I come back over to this one, notice how I'm going through my tabs now to go back between scripts, and I run just that script, there's no data in there. But luckily, I took out my insert statement. I can come over here and I can update some ages too. Mike Schmidt's probably 60 now. And then let's go ahead and change some ages here. 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. Okay, so we gave him all kinds of ages. So let's rerun this. This time, I'm not going to highlight anything, and I'm just going to execute it. And see how it went ahead and, and ran all those? Let's see if it, all those rows went in there. And those rows are in there. So that we're inserting, we're updating, we're deleting, all kinds of good stuff. And remember when we did the where clause where we said Mike and then we said like Schmidt? Well, I'm going to go do that again. And I want to use the underscore. I want to get all those that have numbers on them. And let's just delete those. How does that sound? So I'm going to copy that word clause. I'm going to my delete statement. Get rid of my semicolon, and I'm putting the where clause in there. So now I'm going to delete all customer records where the first name is Mike and the last name is like Schmidt, but it includes an, an extra character in there. So let's highlight that, and let's execute it. That got rid of five rows. Let's see if it got rid of the rows we wanted to get rid of. Boom. So now we're sitting there with the three rows that we should have had from the beginning. So now we've run the delete statement. So let's go back and check out our agenda, see how we're doing. We're almost 30 minutes in, and we've done the quick introduction, created the database, created the table, insert it, select it. We did a few where clauses. We updated the data. We deleted the data. Now we need to change and add some columns. So let's go do that. So in here we have first name, last name, and age. Um, what else should we add to that table? I think we should add city. So before I add city, I do want to tell you something about comments. As you're creating scripts, you, you want to put a comment in there and say, this deletes Mike Schmidt. Okay, so when I say that, um, see how it turned green? Well, this is a one-line comment. If I go to the next line and start typing, it's no longer a comment. And so a lot of times you'll put this at the top of a script. But then you can also have multi-line comments where you put a slash and a star, and it'll, the comment remains until you end with a star and a slash. I do this around delete sometimes when I'm testing things so that you can highlight in case I come over here and I just run something. So let me just run uh, execute. It says command complete successfully, but nothing ran. Okay, to, to prove that, I want to go in here. I'm going to highlight all those and run them. Now we should have our Mike Schmitz back. And I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to hit F5 and say complete successfully and we still have our Schmitz. So I, I can't accidentally delete something, but I can still highlight it, hit F5. Five rows are deleted, and now we're back to no Mike Schmitz. So that's the commenting. So now um, let's go ahead and add our column, and we want to add city. So I'm going to do another new query. To add a column, you can say what's called alter table, and we can say customer, and then we can say add, and you tell the column you want to add. I'm going to say city. And city is just going to be another string of stuff. Um, so I'm just going to say varchar 50. So if I hit F5, command completed successfully. So let's go back over here, execute our query, 
<clears throat> in this case, notice how I don't see city, um, but also notice how I specified the actual columns. Normally when I write queries, um, initially I just put a star. We'll go back here and do star, and there's our city. And notice how nothing's in it. We didn't insert data into it yet. Um, so we can go ahead and we know how to do an update. So let's do an update to the city column. Notice how city isn't showing up in our IntelliSense. We can go back here to edit, IntelliSense, refresh local cache, and now when I type city in, it should show up. And so I just want to say city and I want to put dot and let's put um, let's put New York. Okay. And I don't want to just do Joey Blue. So I'm going to take that off and let's just update and see what happens. So if I come back here and select from customer, there you go. They're all New York now. If we just want to update one, we could easily go back. I'm going to hit Control Z. I use this a lot. That's an undo. There's also undos up here. And if I want to just update my city, Goddard, it updated one row. If we go back, now Goddard's updated. You can also, if we want to update Barry Bonds, we can update him, San Francisco. I know I'm not spelling that right. Yeah, I need to put a C here. So I'm going to update it one more time. So here where I misspelled it, I'm updating the same record, with set in city to San Francisco. I'm going to rerun the select, F5, and San Francisco. Okay, so now we have our customer table. So the next thing we need to do is, oh, I need to add one more column. So let's go add one more column. And I'm going to add a primary key column. Okay, so what I want to do after all that work, I want to go ahead and drop this table. So you can see how you can drop a table. So if I type drop table customer, come back, hit F5, and then I try to select from that table, it's no longer there. So we have lost our table. So we've got all kinds of queries in here. Um, I, and this is if you name them, it kind of helps out. So let's start with the first one. We're going to create table. And this time, I'm not just going to have age. I'm going to go ahead and put the city in. And we know that's a varchar 50. And then I want to go ahead and put a customer ID. And I'm just going to call it ID. And it's going to be an integer. And I'm going to do a couple clauses here. I'm going to tell it it's the primary key. So the primary key is means that that column by itself will uniquely identify a row. So if two people have the exact same first and last name and age, the ID will identify them. So that's going to be unique. And secondly, in SQL Server, I'm going to, you can say identity. It's an identity column. And you want it to start with one and increase by one every, t every row. So now that ID column will, will fill in for itself. We don't have to fill it in. Every time you insert a record, it will fill that in. Put a comma there. I'm going to recreate this table by hitting F5. And now that's there. So let's go back and select. Now we have ID, first name, last name, age, and city. Let's go insert our records again. See if I can find them. And now what we want to do is I want to add city here because now we're going to add city in and then we want to um, put in Mike Schmidt and let's just say Kansas City again. I'll put KC for short. Okay, so now I need to do that with all the queries. 
Just drop those in there. Drop those in there. So I'm hitting Control C and Control V, which is something you'll want to use a lot um, for this, for any time you're programming. So we'll put Goddard. We're going to put San Francisco. Okay. So I'm going to insert those three rows. Done. Let's go back and select them. So we've got those back in. Now notice when it inserted, I did not put in the ID, but it went ahead and automatically incremented. Okay, so now what we need to do is, this is our customer. Our customer is going to buy products from us. So we need an orders table and we need a, um, a products table. So let's create a products table. So we're gonna do a new query. Say create table, um, product, and we're going to want a product ID. And I can just say ID again, and I can say int primary key, and I can say identity. Come on. So that's going to give me a an, an primary key identity column. And we could say product underscore ID. Some people do it that way. Some people just say ID. We're just going to put ID right now. And then um, all I want is a product name for this training. So I'm just going to say product name. And I'm going to say varchar50 again. OK, so now we've got some products. And let's go down here and select from them. OK, so now we need to insert into them. So we're going to say insert into products and we'll give the column product name values and then we need to give a product since we're talking about baseball players I'm going to say a baseball and then and now I'm thinking about it we probably want one more thing in here and so I'm going to alter this table. Products. And I'm going to say add um, price. We may want a price on it. And in this case, um, the price is going to have decimals in it. So it can't just be an integer. So we're going to say in, in SQL Server, you can have floats and numeric and decimals. And we're just going to do a float. And that's going to give us a number that can have floating point decimals. So I'm going to put that in there, select back from it, and let's toss in a price. And so a baseball we're going to put at 595. And notice how we don't need ticks around it because it is a number. And instead of a baseball, let's go bat. That's probably like um, 195.99. Okay, let me put price here. And so let's go ahead and insert both of those rows. Highlight them in F5. Let's select back from the pri products table. So now we have some products. And then let's go ahead and do, and I'll just keep going down this page. Create table order and inside the orders table we're going to need to put in um, who bought it and what the order was so we're going to put in the customer ID it's an int and then we're going to put in the product ID, and it's an int. And then we need an order ID. And in this case, I'm just going to put ID. I'm going to put order ID. So there's two different ways, two different rules of thought there. If you have the same columns that say ID, um, you know, that, that can be good for some things. Sometimes you want to put order ID. Um, I'm going to put order ID. Int, and I'm going to put primary key. And I'm going to put um, identity one comma one. Okay. 
and then let's go ahead and put order date in here give you give you a date type of variable so here we're going to do an order date and if there's a date time and that will store a date and a time all in one place okay so now we can order there's a date of the order there's the ID and the product okay run that now let's select from the orders table okay so we got the table now we need to insert some data into the table so let's go ahead and do a few insert statements before we can do that though we've got to select some data out and figure out what data this is where you when you write your interfaces your web interface or your your programs um, they'll do all these inserts we need to see what IDs to put in there so I want to select from all of our tables select star from products and select star from um, customers okay it must just be customer sorry okay notice how I ran all three of those queries together and so I got three result sets we got the orders here we got the products here we got the customers here so let's go ahead and um, what I'm going to do is actually well let's create one of these and then I'm going to just insert a bunch of orders so if we want to insert into the orders table we say insert into and into is an optional keyword you don't have to put into in there and it would still work I say orders and then just like everything else we're gonna put the columns we don't we don't need order ID we're gonna say order date um, I'm gonna say customer ID I'm gonna say product ID and then we're gonna say values and order date I want to put in um, nine actually I'm gonna use something called the get date and this is specific to SQL Server it'll get the date right now um, so you'll see exactly when I'm making this training so put get date in there and then we want the customer ID let's have Barry Bonds if you look down here his ID is number two so I'm put two in there and then he's gonna buy a bat and we'll put two in there okay so let's run that and let's see what's in the orders table so on September 13th customer 2 purchased product 2 and let's insert a few more things so um, let's go ahead and do product 1 and let's do customer 1 product 1 and let's have customer one keep buying a few products and then let's have um, customer two or customer three and the reason I, I'm just remembering what these customers are here so let's pull these back so you can see we've got a whole bunch of orders now and let's see customer three let's have uh, Mike Schmidt buy some bats so he's gonna buy some bats so I'm gonna put um, a bat is ID, ID two remember product ID 2 here okay so let's buy some bats he's gonna buy a bunch of bats so I'm just hitting F5 a bunch of times okay so now we have some orders so we have order IDs and the way way we design this may not be the best because one order can only have one product to purchase so not the best so there's other ways to design this um, and basically have one order with multiple lines but we don't want to make it over complicated so right now we're just leaving it like this so you can see we've got 20 orders now so that's great so how would you see what it is because this table by itself it's very hard to see well who bought it and what did they buy and what was the total amount right so that moves us into the next step where we've got primary keys on the tables um, we really what we need to do is we've created more tables 
a primary key is an index. Let's talk about indexes for just a second. We don't need one here, but if you wanted to, on the if you end up having a million customers in this table, it could get slow to query. And if everybody always queries off a last name, you can create an index on the last name, um, and it would give you it would give you better speed if you're doing a where clause against the last name. In this case, we only have three, so there's no need. Um, so let's go back here. The foreign keys, we do need to create those. Um, we need to make sure when somebody creates an order that there's actually a customer and a product for it. So let me show you what I mean by that. So if we create an order, and if I put customer four in here, well, if you remember, there is no customer four. There's only three customers. So what if I put customer four and insert it in here? Well, it went in just fine right now, but that is an invalid customer. There is no customer four, so this is bad. And in relational databases, now that we have multiple tables, they all relate to each other, and that's where you get the relational database. Well, we need to make sure these relate relationships are good. And to do that, we have to put foreign keys on them. And so I'm gonna create a brand new query. And what we need to do is alter our orders table. So we're gonna say alter um, table orders. And we're going to say add a foreign key. And you see as these turn blue that they're reserved words. And then we gotta say what column in the orders table. And so in the orders table, first we're gonna do the customer ID. And then we're gonna say it references the customer table. And then in customer table, we called it ID. So let's take a look at that over here so you can see it real quick. Table, refresh. So in the orders table, we have columns. It's called customer ID here. It would have been nice if I would have went ahead and consistently named these, but I didn't. It's called the ID table, ID column over here. So that's where we need to get these synced up. So we have the customer ID from the orders table references the customer's table and we want the ID column. So let's run that. So now it says alter table statement conflicted with foreign key constraint. The con conflict occurred in the customer with the column ID. Well that's exactly our problem. So let's go back here. We have this bad record. Order ID 21. Let's delete that. We know how to delete now. So I'm going to say delete the orders table, but I don't want to delete the whole thing, where order ID equals 21. So let's go ahead and run that. So now when we look at the order table, that record's gone. We come back here, rerun this, and now it completed. it. So you can't have bad day when you run it, so the, it's good to actually just create these foreign keys as you create the tables. So you need to know your structure beforehand. We're kind of creating as we go, and so that's causing this. So let's make a copy of this. We need one more. We're going to alter the table, orders table, and I want to grab the product ID, and make sure the product relationship is good. So I'm going to go to the product table, and it's called ID there. So this gave me a foreign key relationship, um, invalid table product. Okay, what did I call it? Products? Products, okay. There we go. Let's do that again. Okay, so we got it in there. So now we got our two foreign keys. Now what's cool, let's go back up here and refresh our tables. And let's take a quick look at the orders table. And let's go to the keys. Notice you have a primary key and you have some foreign keys going to customer and product ID. You also have the primary key. So let's go here and look at customer and it just has a primary key. And products has a primary key. So now that we put these relationships in, let's go try that insert again that was really a bad insert. This 4-2, let's do that. 
So now it will not let us insert bad data. And so this is where you get the whole relational database because all these tables are now related to each other. And this is the referential integrity that, that you need to put on your tables to make sure the data stays good. Okay, so let's go back to our agenda. Okay, so we got primary key indexes, we created more tables, we created our foreign keys. Now we need to join our tables together. Let's do that. So I'm going to start a brand new, I'm going to grab these three queries here. I want to start another new query. And we got a blank screen here. We've got our three tables. Now remember the orders table it's hard to tell what products are ordered. So let's create a new query that joins that back to the product table. So if I say select star from orders, you can actually join tables by using the join clause. And I'm going to say enter join. So enter join means everything has to equal up in both tables. We want the orders table to join up to the products table and we want the we want to say on so this is what the two things are going to join together on so let's look at those two tables together real quick where'd they go okay they jumped down here because I got so many orders okay so the customer ID let me pull this up a little more in the order table we have a product ID wherever we see a one we want to join over to the product table and get that record one we want the name and the price to come out that's what we want to show up so what we're going to do is we join on this product ID column to the ID in the product table so let's do that so we're going to say we're orders or we say on orders dot and we're going to say the column name And you know what, before I do that, let's refresh the cache. I'm not liking all these red lines. Okay. So now it'll give me some help. Okay, so we're going to say orders.productID equals to the products.id. So now in, in, in this language, in, in SQL Server, when you do this star, it's going to grab all the columns from both tables. So let's do that. So now you can see we've got the product name and the price and the order date. So we really don't need product ID anymore. And we'll get rid of that in just a second. I want to show you another thing called aliasing. We can call the orders table. We say as O. And now we can reference everywhere we said orders, we can just reference O. It shortens up your syntax. For the products table, we can say as P. And then we can reference just P everywhere. And that's the exact same query that you just wrote. And to further simplify it, as is a, is a optional word, so I can actually get rid of it. So let me get rid of that. And so now we've still aliased our tables as O and P, and it still runs. Okay? Now you can do the same thing on columns. So what I want to do first, I want to say O dot star. That grabs everything out of the orders table. I'll run that. And then I want to say um, P dot star. Right there. And so I just grabbed everything out of the product table too. But I really don't want O dot star. I really just want, um, actually I'm going to leave that for just a second. Let's go ahead and go get the customers. All we do is we do another inner join and we do customer, um, the customer table and I'm going to alias it as C on and I want to join the orders table O dot customer ID this time equals to C dot ID. Okay, if I run this, will I get the customer data? Not just yet. Because the way I did this up here, I need to put a comma and I need to go get the C dot star. Okay, so now if I scroll to the right, 
Now we've got the customer data. So now let's put this all together. I want to just clean it up. So in the order table, I really just want the order date. In the product table, um, I think I want everything. In the customer table, I want everything. So let's see what that looks like. Oh, I don't want everything. I just want p dot product name and p dot price. Okay, so we can sit here and clean this up a bunch, but we've now joined our data back together, and we see Barry Bonds spent $195 on a bat. He spent $595 on a baseball, and then we can also see that um, the city that the product was bought in is San Francisco for $5.95. So let's take a step back for a second. I'm going to minimize that, get my screens up here. And I actually want to edit the city. Um, for Barry Bonds, I'm going to put Goddard. Okay, so we're updating that customer. now. Let's go back here and look at what happens to our order. So Barry Bonds did have a city of San Francisco. Now it has a city of Goddard. So we can see that um, the city changed as soon as the person changed. You may or may not want that and you have to design your databases differently and that gets into database architecture. But that's just something I wanted you to see. So the final things that we need to talk about are functions and group buys. And we're going to do that right now because we have this all summed up. What I want to do is I want to just look at the total money spent so far. So I'm going to get rid of this and I'm just going to grab that price column and I want to sum it. So I'm going to type sum right there highlight it at five two thousand seven hundred seventy nine dollars and fifty six cents has now been spent through the order system and you can do that with the sum now notice how there's no column name there the same way I alias those tables I can say as total I can alias the column so if I rerun this now it says total there and again as is a is a optional word so you can just put a space in total and it still works. Now what if I want to do this by customer? So I just summed the whole table. If I want to do it by customer, I've got to put a customer field there. So I'm put a comment, I'm going to go back a space, and I'm going to put um, my customer is C dot, and I'll just do it by last name. Okay, which this isn't exactly right, you probably want to do it by ID because people could have the same last names but for this case we're going to do that. If I run this it's not quite going to work. As soon as I put this in here and I tried to run a, a sum it wants to group it up. It wants to know how we want to group it. So there's another clause called group by and you put the same thing up here that you had the last name. So we're going to group by last name we're going to sum up the price. And so now we know that Joey Blue spent $29, Barry Bond spent $201, Mike Schmidt spent $2,500. Okay, we could also get the total instead of by name, we could also go by um, name and the product they bought. So we do p dot product name. And that's not going to run because we need to group a little more. So let me come in here and put the grouping down here so we're going to group by last name and product name. Highlight that. So now we know that um, Joey Blue spent $29 on baseballs, Bonds bought baseball and bats, and then Schmidt bought just bats. Okay? And so we've grouped by, we summed, we could also put um, an average. Um, so let's take product name back off and let's do location so C dot city okay because we know that um, we had me and Barry Bonds and Goddard right now so we've got two cities 
and then instead and we have the sum I want to go ahead and put in one more thing I'll put an average and on average price okay in this case I don't have to put any more group buys because I'm just putting another aggregate okay not not a column that I'm grouping by but an aggregate so let's go in here and you can see that the total the average for the Goddard area per order was $33. The average for the Kansas City, which we know is Mike Schmidt, is $195 because all he bought was bats. So it's, the average is going to be the exact same as the, what the bat price is. So let's look at our agenda, make sure that we covered everything. Um, we did a quick introduction of SQL, created database and tables, insert it, select it from the table, did some work clauses, did some updates, some deletes. Um, we changed the table, we even dropped the table. We added primary keys, we talked about indexes, we created more tables, made relationships with foreign keys, we joined with those relationships, and then we ultimately summed and averaged and grouped by. So I think we got through everything. Um, that's as much as I can cram into here. I actually have another training that's on Udemy that usually goes for about 10 bucks. That's about 10 hours worth of this. So if I'm, I went too fast in this, you can always go out there for about 10 bucks. You can um, see 10, 10 hours of, listen to 10 hours of me talking basically and doing the same stuff, but getting in deeper, slowing down a little bit um, and trying to get um, you know a little more in depth in some of this stuff. So hopefully this is helpful. Um, let me know um, with any comments you have. Um, I hope that uh, I covered everything you need for, to get started. Um, other than that, you can look at, once you've gone through this and done some, some of this yourself, you can look at my other videos. I go into a little more depth in some other features, some of the functions and different things like that. Um, so anyways, let me know, leave some comments. Um, we'll talk to you later.